Hey, it's Rod Yates. Welcome to another episode of Humans of Music, a Jackster podcast. Each episode, I talk to a music creator or industry professional about their life and career, the ups and downs of their journey, and the lessons they've learned. And my special guest today is British singer songwriter Nilofer Yanya. Nilofer was discovered at the age of 20 when she started uploading demos to SoundCloud. She quickly released a series of EPs for which she was long listed for the BBC Sound of 2018, followed by her acclaimed debut album, Miss Universe. As the daughter of two visual artists, art has always played a central role in Nilofer's life. As well as playing music, she co-founded an organisation called Artists in Transit, which delivers art workshops to communities in times of hardship. We talk about Artists in Transit in this interview, as well as Nilofer's upbringing and path into music, but we started by talking about her new album, Painless, and the kind of record she was trying to make. It definitely felt like a, a rock album. Okay. Yeah, more so than the... I think because the first record, like, I was definitely trying to be like, oh, it's not, it's not just indie music, like, because mm. <laughs> you feel like, oh, you're in this, like, indie bubble, and you're like, I'm not just the indie, like, person. <laughs> sure. And then this, the second record, I'm like, this is, like, a real, like, for me, it sounds like a real, like, guitar record, like, that's what it sounds like. What about lyrically? Were, were, mm. there, were there themes or concepts on the record that, that you started to explore, whether it was on purpose or, again, instinctively? Mm. Um, like, I'm still kind of, like, um, understanding it myself because mm. lately, like, I've, I mean, I've answered, like, quite a lot of questions <laughs> about <laughs> these kind of things and I've been like, oh, yeah, but what is it about? Because at the beginning, at the time I was writing it, like, I didn't really think about too much and then I kind of, like, I kind of said like it happened in such a short place of time sure. I didn't really have that much time to like think about it too much afterwards mm. um, and like conceptualize it so I'm still kind of in the process but um it does feel like a lot like it's influenced by like environments and like consciously thinking about how your environment affects you and now that I'm saying it as well that like, makes a lot of sense with like the past two years everyone's had with the pandemic is that where a song like Stabilize comes from? Yeah. I, I believe the references to high rises and, and small flats rotten to the core. Is that a, mm. a reference to the Chelsea that you grew up in? Yeah, I mean, like Chelsea doesn't have a lot of um, high rises. I don't know if you <laughs> if you know about it in no. Australia. But it's like, so the area I live is actually like the richest borough in the whole of the UK. Okay. But there's still like massive disparities between, it's like the super, super wealthy people. And then there's like just really, really normal people because that's how cities work. <laughs> yeah. But there's still like a massive gap, which is I've always found interesting. And I think because I, I grew up on like, you know, just the normal side, like being a normal person, mm. but you're always witnessing this like massive kind of wealth. And it's definitely strange, especially when you get older and you kind of realize like how the class system works and all these things work, which still play like a massive part, I think, in the UK. Yeah. Of power and. Yeah, kind of the imbalance of power. And they got me thinking about spaces as well, because like places that you live and places that you spend a lot of time really do affect the way you kind of see things and how you feel and the things you think you can achieve, I think, sure. kind of really affects that. So we, we mentioned um, Stabilize as being a song where, where that's kind of addressed, if, if I'm mm. correct. Yeah. Are there other elsewhere on the album where, that's, where, where you can hear that in the record? Um, I would say like Midnight Sun. Okay. And possibly Shameless as well. It's kind of like being about stuck. They're both about being like stuck in places. But I mean, that sounds a bit more hopeful because it's like you have this like chance to like kind of escape. And Shameless, it's kind of the same, I guess. It's a bit more hopeful, but then it's kind of exploring like a different side to it. Or, yeah. Okay. Midnight Sun um, was one of the songs I was going to ask you about. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wondering where you were at in your life when you wrote that, if there had been particular events that, that really inspired that that song. I think it was just everything, like, <laughs> um, especially, yeah, kind of like the, the kind of sense I was getting from like everybody's like starting to like wake up to like lots of issues. Um, okay. But not everybody has the the willpower or maybe not maybe that's not fair to say maybe it's like maybe not everyone feels like they can change things still even though they're aware of them so that they're kind of feeling frustrated and with like what are some of the 
I guess, political and social ideas that you're talking about there in terms of people waking up to things? And were you also waking up to them or were you just noticing it in other people? I think like when it's seeing like the, the mass, like, I feel like it's a ma- like a mass waking up, like everyone, or maybe not everyone waking up, maybe like people are admitting things and being like, okay, yeah, we actually need to do something about this. Whereas before it was like more like a, a conversation, but not like a full on like topic. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it does. <laughs> like people would see it as like a small issue, but not like a big issue. Yeah. I feel like there's loads of things in the past, in the past few years that have been like that. Um, I guess one of them for me was like Black Lives Matter movement. Mm-hmm. It felt like a, especially in the UK, like it felt like a big, a big topic that it's always, always been there, but like people had never really seen it as like an important topic. Mm. And and how did, how did that movement impact you? I don't really know, but my family kind of did quite, well, my aunt in particular, she ended up doing quite a lot of research into our family tree because my granddad's from Barbados. Mm. We basically found out who the enslavers were of like who my family were enslaved by in Barbados. And it's a really interesting thing because like the guy's family who enslaved my family, (laughs) he was known as like a big merchant in Bristol, which is like a big city in the UK. Yeah. He's got loads of like monuments in his name and like things saying like what a great guy he was. Right. But completely missing how he made his money and like, where they got all their wealth from. And yeah, he was known as like the King of Bristol. Wow. Yeah, it's quite fascinating. Were you aware of that history prior? No. I mean, like, obviously, like I knew where my family was from, but like, I didn't, I didn't realize how all connected it was and like how kind of close to home it is. Yeah. Like I've been to Bristol, but I never thought like, oh, this is, you know, I never like, I would, I would never have joined the dots like that. No. Yeah. And presumably you would have seen that the statues in Bristol. Yeah, and like, because there was that big statue that got taken down. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys heard about it there, but that was like a big thing as well. Shortly after like the George Floyd murder, mm. it's like a couple of weeks or something. Yeah. My aunt actually like, she gave a witness statement for the Colston Four, um, which I think helped get them like not guilty. The Colston Four? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the guys that like took down, the, like threw the statue in the river. Right. Um, they tried to get charged with like criminal damage by the uh, government and I don't know, the council, because technically like removing a statue is like criminal damage. Mm-hmm. But like with, in the UK, like people are trying to change the laws. So like people that did that kind of thing, because basically all these statues are like wrong because they're not, <laughs> yeah. they're stating like what great people they were, but not saying like what also horrible people they were. So, you know, not so great people. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's like, there's like so many statues in the UK like that. Yeah. And it must have had an incredible effect on your aunt as well. Yeah. Like it's totally kind of changed her um, path at the moment in her life. Wow. Okay. And yeah. are these events reflected in the record? Uh, I mean, like, I think because I'm like, abs- like just absorbing things, what's going on mm. in my life. I don't really want to try and speak for like everyone because I feel like that's not fair. Sure. Um Cause it's just my perspective and yeah. like my, what I'm, my, I'm experiencing, but um, yeah, like midnight's on, I feel like it's kind of a bit about, you know, people wanting to do the right thing and people wanting to kind of get the energy from somewhere. Sure. Like they don't want to keep them, their mouths shut or their eyes closed, but like you get the sense that they've, they've been like that for a while. Yeah. Okay. Um. And, and last question about the statue. So did, I, did you yeah. mention the name of the, the person who was the statue was of? Oh, that was that was Edward Colston. Oh, Edward. Edward okay, Colston. gotcha. Right. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense of the Colston. Force. That was the yeah the original statue that got taken down. Okay, yeah. right. And it kind of started this whole um, movement of people wanting to rectify what's on the plaques and what's on the statues. Yeah. Okay. You, you mentioned your heritage. I understand that that your mother is has Irish Barbadian um, heritage, and your father has yeah. um, a Turkish. Um, heritage as well did those did those different cultural elements filter into your upbringing definitely yeah um (laughs) definitely I just don't know how to um definitely they filtered it but like because I was born here and I grew up here like I always identified with being from like London and because it's like all the places are kind of far away (laughs) yeah (laughs) um like I've never been to Barbados okay but I did we did go to Turkey quite a bit 
well, not loads actually, like a few times when I was younger, but I still can't speak Turkish properly. So okay. I'm studying now. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Why, why at this stage of your life have you started to study it? Uh, I just realized like if I don't do it now, like I'm never going to do it. Like I have to commit myself <laughs> while I'm still kind of young to, to learn. Otherwise, but like when I was younger, I always was like, oh, my dad didn't teach me. Like I always blamed him. Right. And now I'm older. I'm like, okay, I can't blame anyone. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I guess when, when I was asking if, if the, the heritage filtered into your upbringing, mm. where, um, I mean, was there much discussion about um, where your family's ancestor, ancestors had come from? Do, was it a, a prevalent part um, in your, a prevalent sort of topic in your house? I guess that was um, what, what mm. I was asking with that. Yeah, it is. It was. Yeah. My dad would, you know, always talk about Turkey and like my mum, I guess she, she was born in London as well. So she kind of were a bit more similar in that respect. Mm. My nan was like very Irish and she would always talk about Ireland. So Okay. <laughs> So you're aware of it? Yeah, definitely aware. Yeah. yeah, I think I'd read a quote from you, which was which was interesting, where it suggested that when you were a little bit younger, you almost pushed that away just to try and really affirm your status as mm. a Londoner, where perhaps for mm. your own personal identity. W- was that the case? Yeah, I mean, like I think it's like you're you're wanting to um, find things in common with like your friends or Mm. the place that you live and not find the differences. So you're kind of, uh, I guess, like assimilating more than you'd be like, this is who I am. Like, I feel like in London, everybody stands out because everyone's different, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) everyone comes from different places. So it's not like an issue in the same respect as it would be in a small town, but like everyone's from the same place. Yeah. Okay. But there still is a bit like you assimilate rather than be like, you know, this is who I am. Also, I think that's kind of also like a personal thing because my family's like very mixed. Whereas maybe if my dad was from Turkey and my mom was just maybe from England, then Mm -hmm. I'd feel differently about it because it's like already quite a mix going on. It's like, you (laughs) you kind of grow up and you're just like, wait, who am I? Like, you're not going to focus on, you're not going to start carving out like, you know, paths for yourself. Like you're just going to try and be who, I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> no, that makes sense. Yeah, you're going to be yeah. who, who you are and, and the simulation, yeah. as, as you mentioned, with your peer group. Um, yeah. There's the song on the record, um, El Ar, where you play the saz, if I pronounce it correctly, which I believe is yeah. a, a Turkish instrument and one that yeah. your dad used to play or perhaps still does play. Um, yeah. What Can you explain what that instrument is and, and, and how you came to learn it? Yeah, I mean, I don't play it, like, very well. <laughs> uh, it's, like, a very small part of the record, which I'm playing it, like, probably, like, 1%. <laughs> <laughs> it's an important um, 1%. Yeah, it's different. Uh, I don't know, my dad always played it when I was growing up, and over lockdown, it must have been over lockdown, um, he gave me it because he was going to get a new one or something. <laughs> um, yeah, so he gave me his old one. And I just started playing on it. And then when I was writing that song and I was working with the producer, um, Billion, he's like very like experimental anyways. Like he'll always want to like try different instruments and different sounds. Yeah. So like when I suggested it, he wasn't like, whoa, that's weird. He was like, <laughs> cool. He was like, definitely let's try that out. So it just, it worked. Like we layered it and like it sounded much better than how I was playing it. <laughs> it's like, a, it's, it kind of, it's like a guitar in a way, but it's like a very like more older um version and it doesn't have a hole at the front it's got a hole at the side okay and then the tuning is completely different which is the trickiest part is the tuning right and like this like three strings sit together and then the other three strings sit together and then the other three strings sit together oh right yeah wow but it's it's basically like a guitar but different you mentioned that your dad would play that when you were younger what other musical memories do you have from from your upbringing from hearing music in your house and or, or witnessing it being played mm. i mean my mom she would be like piano um and she was really into like classical music mm. that was the reason why i started music because she was like oh you should do piano so i did <laughs> <laughs> and i think I, I must have liked it otherwise she wouldn't have told me to do it sure <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's like she wanted to do that when she was younger and like no one really encouraged her. So she wanted to encourage her own children to do the same thing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, my uncle, he's a producer. So yes, he, I guess like his, it's like going around to my uncle's and aunt's house, like they'd always be playing music and like they had those vinyls and like 
kind of a bit more like the standard way you imagine people getting into music. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like seeing it happen. Yeah. And, and that studio that, because um, your uncle has a studio, which is that down in Penzance? Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. And is it true that you you would go there on family holidays as as a teenager and yeah. and get yeah. um, exposed to the studio in that regard? Yeah, we all loved it. Like it was so like you go in and just like play like tunes really really loud, <laughs> and you just, you go like, feel the bass like, and it was quite amazing really because like before that they didn't have a studio, um, and he like would work in like various studios in like London and like witnessing them like you know, want to move to Cornwall so they could have the space to build the studio was like mm. kind of kind of amazing to see someone's like whole life go into that one space. And now he can just like work there all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, that dedication and, and the dedication to art, I mean, seems to have been um, a common theme of your upbringing with your parents being visual artists as well. When, with those experiences that you just mentioned of your uncle and, and with your parents' occupations, did, did you, you must have grown up just assuming that art was important and part of everyday life. Is, is that the case? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, definitely feels important. And did you learn about art from watching them at work, from watching your parents and how they operated? Yeah, yeah. I, my dad's also like art teacher. Like he teaches like, um, he does a lot of classes, mm. mainly for like older older students, not like kids, but he's a really good teacher. So like if I, if I asked him something, he would always help me as well. Okay. Yeah. And he's like a really good like technician. So if there's anything like technical, like he'd, he'd kind of <laughs> already have that down and like kind of be like, this is how you do it kind of thing. Right. Like, this is the whole process behind yeah. it, which I think, I mean, art at school is, I think the schools I went to had a really big emphasis on art, but mm. um, I think in a way they don't want to be too judgmental. They do kind of skip on like technical side of things sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So ha- like having that was really helpful. And were you a naturally artistic kid? Did you gravitate towards art, whether it be visual or musical? Yeah, we all did actually. Yeah, definitely. Visual and musical. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's played out because, I mean, I believe that your sister has been involved in directing some of your videos um, or at least the, mm-hmm. the same damn luck video. And um, all of I, them. She does all of them. She does all of them, right. And and <laughs> yeah. did she also do the, the cover art for your early EPs as well? Uh, I actually did those. Oh, you um, did? Okay. Yeah, I did. I've done nearly all the artworks apart from like the past two singles that I released. Okay. But yeah, I do. Mo- like I try to do all the artworks myself. <laughs> yeah. What What's, how important is it to you to, um, I, I don't know if control is the right word, but to at least have that fam- familial, the, the family around you? when you're being creative and when you're, you're doing things such as video clips or, you know, you're doing your own artwork. Is, is that important to you? Yeah. I mean, I didn't realize that at the beginning, but I guess in one way it felt like I already know someone that's really good at this kind of stuff and mm. they happen to be related to me. So like, it'd be kind of a waste. <laughs> it feels like a waste, not of opportunity not to work with them. Cause you're like, why wouldn't I work with them? Yeah. Um, unless you don't get on, that's another thing. Right. But <laughs> I think because we get on, like, um, it's also like I'd be asking their opinion anyways. <laughs> like, I'll ask, I'll, ask my, I'll ask my sisters and my brother's opinion on, like, almost everything. Okay. So it's like <laughs> they'd kind of be having me do the job anyways. <laughs> <laughs> right. So why not just why not just do it properly? <laughs> yeah, that's it. I would imagine, though, that it's, you know, the, the further you go into your music career, perhaps the more voices, outside voices you have around you, and it must be quite comforting to have voices that you trust around you. 100%. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, and I think, like, you waste a lot of energy. I mean, I don't know if that's true, but, like, for me, the reason I make music is to make music. Like, I love, I mean, doing the videos and making the artwork is fun, but, like, mm. I don't see myself as, like, a visual artist. Like, it's, like... I see myself as like a music artist. So yeah. if I'm going to have to always be looking for new people to work with, that's also like quite, <laughs> it takes up a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of energy. <laughs> and I'm not ready. I'm not ready to commit to that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. So we, we were talking earlier about um, the music that you heard growing up. What was, what was the first album that you ever bought? Oh, I don't know. Um, I didn't really have my own like music collection. For a long time. Okay. Yeah, I was born like in a weird time where nobody bought CDs anymore, but right. <laughs> you just had to like 
yeah, like stream music, but it wasn't, there wasn't Spotify or anything. So you could bought it or just like illegally streamed it. When I was a teenager, like I, my song, was, my iPod was like full of music, but I don't, I don't remember buying any of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's we've... really bad. It's really bad. <laughs> so bad to say that now. Like everyone's like, oh, you don't, you don't pay for it. Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, who were some, who were some of those artists then that you were, um, you were, you were downloading? <laughs> <laughs> illegally downloading uh, I, I used to like fallout boy like <laughs> yeah <laughs> panic of the disco oh my god um the strokes yeah um the cure i mean i must have got this music from someone else because like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was mainly like guitar bands okay. that i loved like, and anything guitar-y i would listen to basically right well it's interesting with the guitar because you mentioned earlier that you started learning piano on your your mother's um suggestion and i believe you were quite young when that happened um but when you started yeah. learning guitar at the age of 12 i think th- you were i think i've seen you say that you were more taken by the iconography of the guitar or other guitar players for example was there just something about the guitar as an instrument that attracted you to it i just thought it was so cool like i didn't have any i think what i meant by that i didn't have any like guitar like icons it was more just like the image of people playing guitar was enough to be like okay I want to do that too right and the sound of it like obviously I I must have heard it (laughs) not just seen it but I just remember like being obsessed like I would draw guitars like everywhere like and I never played one so yeah I think I was just really into the idea (laughs) so what was it like when you first got one then it was it was so fun like my granddad actually gave my sister some old guitar and I just loved playing it, even though it sounded rubbish. It was like so broken. Yeah. But it sounded, in, in my head, it still sounded really good. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm playing guitar. And then <laughs> when I realized like, oh, like I really should be playing electric guitar. That's when it got a bit trickier, I guess. How so? I would just like dream about electric guitars. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. <laughs> and how did you get one? Uh, I didn't get, I didn't buy an electric guitar until I was like 18. Yeah. I mean, I would sometimes play them at school, but like I never had, I never had one um, until I could buy one. Okay. And it was like a, it was like a really rubbish one, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but it still sounded great to me. I was like, this sounds great. And then slowly I got sick of it. I was like, no, I need to get a proper one. Yeah. And then I got, and then the same thing happened again. It's still happening all the time. It's like, oh, after a while, it's like, this sounds bad. (laughs) (laughs) But you got an amp with it as well, presumably and and distortion pedal. Did you get the full, the full packet? I did. Yeah, I did. I went on like Gumtree. Did you have a Gumtree? Yeah. Yeah. I was on like Gumtree and like bought like the cheapest ones. Like, <laughs> <laughs> And you go to like a random person's house and like pick it up and you're like, yeah. interesting. This is so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah. so when you had that electric, were you instantly playing your own compositions or had there been songs where you thought, ah, oh, when I get an electric guitar, I'm going to learn this and play it? Yeah, I mean, they, it does. It does feel and compl- sound completely different when you play it on um electric mm. uh, versus like an acoustic. But I've kind of already committed to the idea of doing music and like writing and singing by that point. So okay, I had I kind of had lots of material to play around with. <laughs> we have to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere because we'll be back shortly with more from Nilofo Yanya. Welcome back to Humans of Music and my interview with Nilofo Yanya. One of the institutions that seems really key to your musical education was Pimlico School, where I believe they offered subsidised music classes. What what does that mean? What, what do, what's a subsidised music class? So basically, like, normally, if you were going to get, like, a, a teacher or, like, a tutor, like, it would probably be somewhere between, like, 30 to, like, £45 pounds an hour. Mm-hmm. But, like, the music department at Pimlico, they they would do it so like you would pay like 250 pounds for the whole year which they kind of did as a donation as well like if you didn't have it you didn't have to do it okay but um the rest was subsidized by the government they just had a grant basically from the the government like an arts grant and then you could do up to like three instruments right so i did i did piano i did cello for a bit Actually, I had to chill for quite a while. Mm. <laughs> I was really bad and I had the guitar <laughs> and then you could also do as many like after school musical things as, as you wanted as well yeah like orchestras choirs and then you could also like go on tour with the music department like once a year wow so it was kind of insane it was really cool yeah 
and presumably opportunities which you wouldn't have had access to if you'd had to pay the full tuition fees? Yeah. And I think also the environment in which it is, is like really important because it's like, you're not just seeing it as like, oh, okay, you're doing piano now. So you must do this all the time. It's like, mm. it's a more like holistic thing. Like yeah. they want you to study music. And even if you don't choose to become a musician or like, you know, it's still like a part of your education. Like it's, it's, it's totally different to how it's kind of mostly approached, I think. Yeah. And is that where, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, Dave Akumu? Um, from, from yeah. the Invisible and, and who also put out a great record with Jonah's Policewoman last year. Um, yes, yes. He, he was <laughs> he, he was a guitar teacher at the school? He was a guitar teacher because he used to be a student at the school. So, But, yeah, he taught me guitar. Yeah, what did you learn from him? Uh, just some, like basics, really. I was kind of just beginning, so really basic stuff. <laughs> okay. But he also did this rock band after school, like we, me and my friends. There was like a rock band club. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Which was basically just like... All of my friends, um, we did a cover and then I think we did The Cure. Do you remember which song? Yeah, Close to Me. Close okay. to Me, because I remember learning the bum, 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 bum. I guess I remember that so well. <laughs> <laughs> but I also, that was the first time I like showed anyone one, one of my songs and we did one of my songs as well. Wow. Which was kind of amazing, yeah. In in that rock band group? Yeah, and we, we performed it in assembly. <laughs> what was it like? <laughs> terrifying <laughs> terrifying but i loved it was that your first experience of playing of showing someone music which you had written yeah yeah wow and then to see it come to life that must have been a huge moment it was yeah it felt it felt insane at the time yeah. and i wasn't singing it like i had the i'd written the lyrics and but i wasn't singing it like i got my upper friend to sing it <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, I can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. If you you didn't think you could sing at that point, but obviously you're a wonderful singer now with with a very unique voice. When did that come into play? When did you start to realize that you could actually sing the songs you were writing? Thank you. Um, I mean, I think the the, the key is in the unique, like you said. <laughs> <laughs> you start to realize voices aren't like good or bad. That just everyone's got a different like some people won't like your voice or some people might. And like, that was when I realized like I didn't have to sound like what I thought a singer should sound like. Right. And like most of the people I listened to didn't have that kind of voice. I was like, Oh, okay, this is fine. I can sing it just the way I sing it. Yeah. I don't need to like learn to sing. Like I can just sing whatever comes out. (laughs) And in terms of some of those people with, I think I've read you talk about Nina Simone. Is that the sort of artist that you're you're talking about that would, Sort of give you I mean, confidence. I think she has a sort of like subjectively like an amazing voice. So mm. anyone, like no one could disagree, but <laughs> I, I don't think I listen like this. I don't think I listen to herself a bit older, but okay, yeah, she definitely gave me confidence. So yeah. Yeah. What about just even having someone like Dave around you and, and even just teaching you the basics of guitar, as you mentioned, but did that, did the fact that you could see someone in front of you who was making a career out of music, did that give you you could see a pathway or give you a confidence that okay this this is doable yeah yeah um it's crazy because at the time he was teaching us like he was he just released his first record which got like a mercury nomination mm. and i remember him like bringing it in to show us like wow this is this is our record and we were like wow it's so cool and like yeah so stuff i think shortly after that he left because like his career was kind of like you know get going insane so <laughs> yeah but I, at the time I didn't realize but like it definitely is like really really inspirational yeah and I knew he was inspirational then because he just was like a really cool guy mm. and he was really like talented and really really nice more than anything like <laughs> yeah like so friendly so it was a great um like role model to have around yeah and so when I believe it was around about 2014 that you started uploading demos to SoundCloud what were you hoping for when you were doing that? Um, I don't know. It just felt like the thing you should have, you, 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 you were meant to be doing. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what you do. Like, if you write music, like, you should put it on your SoundCloud. Like, yeah. I mean, I was aware they were very rough even then. But I was also, because I wanted to release music eventually, I guess I was kind of like just pretending, acting like, oh, I imagine this is a release. Like, how would I do it? Kind of okay. Thing. Yeah. And so were you still at school at this point? Yeah. I think I just finished like A-levels, so I was like 18. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I started like this other course, like artist development course. Yeah. Somewhere. It's like another music kind of college, but 
not like a regular school. Yeah. Sure. So music was it. You you knew the music path you were it. on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so then when you start gigging around London, how did, did, did that start? Was that through open mic nights? Um, yeah, I did open mics. I did quite a lot of those. And then like I would just book myself gigs. You just email like promoters. Mm. I think I just emailed venues at the beginning because I had one friend who was really good at like getting herself shows. And I was like, how do you do it? And she was like, I'll just email them. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Open mic nights sound terrifying to me. That idea of of just turning up oh. and then going up on stage, presumably by yourself, if, you know, yeah. if that was the case, and then singing in front of an audience. What do you do? You, was it intimidating? Yeah, intimidating. I always hated like performing. Maybe not hated, but like I'm I'm quite a shy person. So like me, the idea of me doing open mic night, especially then, mm. is like really funny to like for me to like try and see it in my head. <laughs> <laughs> like I would never busk I would never busk Like I'm just too scared Okay like, Not that I think like I have nothing against people Doing busking But like I don't want to perform Like naturally Yeah I have to really Kind of talk myself into it And be like You need to do this Like <laughs> Yeah But you did do that Yeah Because I was like I need to If I don't start performing now I'm never going to know How to do it I'm never going to Know if people even like the music So I have to do it <laughs> Off you go. Did you learn anything about performing, even from those early experiences? Uh, maybe. I guess you know, like, kind of straight away if people are listening or not. And it kind of made me realise, like, some songs people wouldn't listen, some people would. So you, I guess I guess so, yeah. Yeah. You get an understanding of what was connecting, perhaps. Yes, yes. And so do you, at what point do you start to feel a little bit of momentum happening, you know, with, with the record label Blue Flowers releasing your Small Crimes mm. EP in 2016. Did you, do you start to get a feeling that, okay, this music is starting to connect with people? Yeah. I mean, I would say like every step, like any, anything positive that happened, it always felt like loads of momentum. Because mm. um, I think at the beginning, like the music, it always feels like, or anything creative, like it almost feels like kind of impossible. So any good thing that happens, you're like, wow, like this is really happening. Yeah. So it gives you like loads of energy to like keep going. Okay. And and was it around that time that you started getting some support slots as well with people like Mitski and, and the XX? Yeah. I mean, the time I met Blue Flowers was also the time I met my manager. Okay. So that happened like kind of at the same time. Um, and then maybe like two years later, that's when I started doing like proper like shows and like tours. Right. You'd released a couple of EPs by that point. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for someone who a few years earlier didn't like performing, when you mm. are when you do start to tour and you do start to get some of these higher profile supports, are you feeling more comfortable at that point? Yes. Yeah. And I think because like you got your like I, I mean I had my band with me, um, mm. so kind of all in together. Um, and then my friends that I've known for like a long time. So you definitely feel comfortable after a while quite quickly, but I'm still not like a natural performer. Like <laughs> <laughs> I'm still awkward person on stage. Like <laughs> nothing's going to change that, <laughs> right? But that could, that's, that can be endearing if it's you, if that's honest. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you like in the in the the minutes before you walk on stage? Then, just very like giddy. Okay, get very giddy. Like it's, you're scared, but it's like the nerves come in like laughter. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but you also feel like very. I mean, I've never been like sick or anything, but like. You do feel sick. <laughs> <laughs> and does that disappear when you walk on stage or does it take a few songs? Depends. Yeah. Okay. Totally depends. Yeah. Okay. There is yeah. a, a couple of years later, you um, get the opportunity to tour with Sharon Van Etten um, around mm. America, I believe. Was was that your first American run? Probably. Probably like, a, no, actually, we'd actually done the tour of Fleet Foxes. Right. Um, the year before in the summer. And that was like a proper first tour okay in the states which was so cool but the one with shine was like amazing that was that was like five weeks <laughs> yeah and it kind of nearly broke it kind of broke everybody but at the same time it was like an amazing tour like it was such a great band to like tour with and support and it was so good but also terrible <laughs> <laughs> because it was long long and like snow. it was winter it was like touring in the winter is crazy in yeah. America. so much snow like Every year, and we don't get that much snow like in, in the UK. So, right. seeing even seeing that much snow for like 
two weeks at a time was like, this is scary. <laughs> <laughs> you're just driving you're driving through snow constantly like it just like kind of blew our minds like <laughs> yeah did it also again in about thinking about lessons that you learned did it teach you about that kind of touring that sort of long long stretch touring in particular america which is such a big country mm. did, did you learn lessons to how to manage that and how to cope with that kind of touring yeah i guess so i mean it was a, it was kind of like a tough way to start the year in one way because that was the beginning of the year and then we still had so much touring for the rest of the year so it, it kind of did um exhaust everyone at the beginning mm. <laughs> <laughs> which wasn't great but it was an amazing experience like I yeah. think you don't get those amazing experiences without putting that hard work and that kind of the the grit behind it so you can't you definitely see like both sides <laughs> yeah yeah what about yeah. Sharon, did you have much of an opportunity to speak with Sharon and, and was she, yeah. was, was there advice or, or just any kind of things that you picked up about your career and how she's operated? Just, I think just being able to like see them play every night and um, hang out with them a bit and like speak to them and all being such nice people, but like amazing, amazing musicians. And just seeing them pull off this incredible show every night, like night after night was definitely like, wow, like that's what that's what he, that's what I want to be able to do when I'm when I'm like in like 10 years or like five years I still want to be able to do this mm. yeah it was just inspiring did your live show step up as a result uh I hope so yeah <laughs> <laughs> I hope so <laughs> there is there is one story which I'm sure you've spoken about um ad ad nauseum but I just wanted yeah. to quickly ask you, and it's it's about, I guess, when you were coming up through the London scene and, and I believe you got approached to join what would have been a, a manufactured girl band. Um, mm. And you decided against it, even though I guess there were a lot of things put on the table for you. What what were mm. the, the circumstances of that? Yeah, uh, it was interesting um, because... I kind of just went along with it. No, I didn't go along with it, but I went, I was like interested just to see what those people were going to say. They basically called me or like dropped me an email or something. They were like, we've got this exciting opportunity for you, but we can't tell you over the phone. Like we have to see you in real life. And I was like, okay. So I went to this meeting and I already had these like weird vibes. I was like, this is going to be something like a girl band or something like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is something I'm not going to want to do. And I'd already, so at this point I was already like working on my own music, like recording stuff, but I was looking for a manager. And these people were a management company. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go to this meeting. Um, and they were like, so we're going to make this girl band, but it's not going to be like, you know, every other girl band. Like we're looking for like proper musicians and like we found you and like we want you to be um, the lead singer, like blah, blah, blah. Um, like, how do you feel about writing like with other writers? And I was like, oh, like I wouldn't be able to write my own songs. And they're like, well, you'd be writing with people. Yeah. Um, but like the album's going to be like, you in three months time, like you'll be you'll have finished the album and you'll be going on a world tour. And I was like, whoa, that's like <laughs> insane. I was like, I did think about it. Cause I was like, this is, this is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, I was like, all the alarm bells are like ringing. All the red flags are showing. Whenever people say something's guaranteed to be a success and they can't tell you who's behind it and they can't tell you like, you know, what exactly it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it, you just, you just have to be like, well, this is definitely one of those things. It's like too good to be true. Like, not that I wanted to do, well, not that I wanted to be in a girl band anyways. Uh, it's just funny. Cause I was like, I don't really, I was like, you know, I write my own music. Like I already kind of know what I want to do. Like, why should I join this band? Yeah. And they said, um, <laughs> well, in like a couple of years time, you'll have like done these albums and then you'll, you can be like your, the solo artist you want to be. Right. And I was like, hmm. And I went home and like talked about it for everyone. And everyone was like, hmm, I guess that is an opportunity, but <laughs> It was so funny because I didn't get back to them in the end. I just thought about it and I just never, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to respond. Really? You <laughs> didn't even go? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cause I was like, they're not chasing me. I'm not going to chase them. Like it's not really, it felt like a weird dream, not like a, a real thing. Sure. I think if you're, if you're, if you're, if that was the thing you wanted to do and you're looking for those opportunities all the time, mm. maybe that's when I, it just seems really seedy to me. Cause it's like, in the end they did get this girl band together um and i only knew this because i bumped into the one of the guys like later on like a few years later right um in like a very funny situation and, <laughs> and he was like oh you were that girl oh yeah like yeah you made the right decision um the girl <laughs> band didn't work out like yeah and i was like wow you guys are so 
so bad. <laughs> right. Because you were you were quite young, I presume, at that point. Yeah. And that you're really gonna tell people young people that and then imagine like that was the thing I wanted to do and then take people along for the ride and then just drop the whole thing. Yeah. Like that's crazy. And then and then was it later that you found out that it was Louis Tomlinson from One Direction who was involved yeah, in, like in it, some way? Yeah. I found out like a, another random way that it was it was some guy from One Direction. And I was like, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So funny. So it's interesting that that even at that age, you had uh, a compass, I guess, about what you wanted mm. to do. And, and that promise of riches and fame wasn't enough for you in terms of what you wanted to achieve. Was that the that, that the case? You had that compass quite early? Yeah. Like, I think, I think my generation does have that, though. Like, um, everyone's aware that I think especially like, you know, the fact no one buys music the way they used to, mm. but you still have, remember kind of what that was meant to be like in a way. I think it's like the generation where like all the girl bands and all the boy bands had just like kind of already been finished in a way. Like I'd seen Spice Girls, I'd seen Sugar Babes yeah. <laughs> um, and I'd seen that phase come to an end. And, you know, I like music, but that's not the kind of music I want to do. And like, I don't know. I can't, I can't remember who was like coming up when I was younger. I remember I saw like artists like Leander Havas when I was like 16 and I was like, wow, that's the kind of artist I want to be. Like, right. That's yeah. awesome. Because she was also, or is also a great guitar player. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, this, this is, this is, this is it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you quickly about uh, Artists in Transit, which is, mm. um, I believe, an organization that you and your sister um, have set up. Um, what can you explain a little bit about, about what, the organization does and how you came to to set it up uh so arts in transit was my sister's idea we're not a charity we're like a collaborative arts project because mm -hmm. we're like a grassroots kind of organization and the main idea behind it was to use art as a form of like solidarity between us and like groups um i mean we were mainly working with refugees in the beginning and we still work with like refugee and migrant families so basically just using art workshops as a way to connect with people. She had the idea, first of all, when she went to, she went to COS, which is like a Greek island at kind of the peak, I guess, of the refugee crisis in like mm -hmm. 2015, I want to, no, 2000, yeah, she went in 2015. And then 2016, we went back as artists in transit um, to do these art workshops. Yeah, and we just basically like do art workshops. <laughs> right. With, with children, with families, with whoever wants to get involved. And we're not like an official kind of organization. We don't not connect it to like NGOs or anything. It was kind of just off our own initiative. And what do you see when you do these workshops? I guess like, I don't want to say easy, but like how easy it is to like get to know people and like how little difference there is between everyone. Mm -hmm. And it's just like people are stuck in like really bad situations for like a long period of time and seeing, I guess seeing mainly how tough it is like to have a family or to be a young person or to be a child or to be an adult and you're you're, you're bringing your family through that really really tough time um and it's so much uncertainty and so much like stress mm -hmm. and you're not treated like a human being throughout any of it and it's just it's kind of insane to be honest mm. yeah and you see the art making a difference or you see those workshops bringing uh, like joy yeah like what's amazing i think when we first started going, we were mainly going to like refugee camps. Um, we, we work with like organizations there. And then we start going to like squats in the area as well. Cause there were the people that weren't kind of just seeing how it all works as well. It's kind of like, like, wow. Like, cause you get an influx of um, refugees come to your country and they have refugee camps set up. But then also there's so many people that can't even get into those camps. Mm. Um, cause they're like already full or they're like, well, we're only, you know, taking in family. So then, People live in like um, abandoned buildings and people start their own communities. It's really interesting. What was I going to say? I think we we are um, just talking about the joy that that you see that yeah. you can bring. Children are just, children are amazing because they, wherever they are, they seem to be, they seem to be happy. I mean, I can't say they're happy, mm. but they're playing games, they're running around, they're creating things naturally. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's really amazing. Yeah. And then you see them in the squats as well. I think that's what you were, what you had been talking about. Yeah. And they're just like making their own worlds. Like children are so amazing. Yeah. Is that is that yeah. just in Greece or is that in London as well now? 
So we do it now mainly in London, like okay. we did it in Greece, but then before that was like pre pandemic. <laughs> right, right. And then because we've had it, you can't travel. And also in Greece, they started shutting down all the squats,、um, moving people out, shutting down the camps, moving them outside of Athens, like places people couldn't get to. Yeah. I think they're trying to like kind of cleanse the way they put it,、um, cleanse the city. Right. Try to make it more like tourist、um, friendly. Okay. Yeah. So now we're mainly working in London. <laughs> right. Okay.、Um, I mean, seeing that must give you an incredible perspective when, when you think about some of the ups and downs of the music industry and your career. Does, do things such as artists in transit and everything you see there, does that give you a perspective to, to put things in perspective in terms of the music industry and how it works? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think it's like a healthy perspective to have <laughs>、mm. because it seems like a lot of the stuff. I do almost makes it seem like unnecessary and very like fun. But you're like, what what does this mean? Like, what is this gonna do? Like, <laughs> yeah, where's the sub, where's the substance? Like, a lot of the things in music, there isn't there isn't much substance or point. It's like, you know, kind of infuriating, I guess, in a way. But then it's interesting because I think the things we take for granted are like what pe- a lot of people are just fighting to be able to do. Like, they just want to be able to. Take that for granted as well. Right. So, like, I, at the same time, I wouldn't want to throw everything I do away and call it rubbish just because it doesn't all have like a profound meaning behind sure, it. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Nilifa, just before we finish up, Jackster is all about giving credit where credit is due. Are there people that you give credit to for helping you get where you are today? Yeah, everybody. <laughs> everybody, everybody, everybody.、Um, my family,、uh, my mom, my dad, my sisters, my brother, my aunts, my uncles, like my band, definitely,、um, like massively, actually. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> All the people I work with, everyone, <laughs> everyone I know. <laughs> you just jogged my memory there. Just quickly, one other thing I wanted to ask you about、yeah. your uncle. We spoke briefly about going to,、mm-hmm. to Penzance on your family holidays, and、yeah. you would see the recording studio. Is, is it true that you recorded your first song on one of those trips in that studio? I did, yeah. And it felt like my first. Professional thing, yeah, <laughs> and it's now deleted, <laughs> like you can't find it. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, me and my sister made a video, like it was, yeah, it was really, it was a great time. <laughs> yeah, Nilofa, thank you so much for your time. It's been really lovely talking to you. Thank you, Rod. You too. <laughs> And that's it for another episode of Humans of Music. A big thanks to Nilofer for her time and thank you for listening. Just a reminder that Nilofer's new album, Painless, is out now. If you have any feedback on the show or suggestions on who you'd like me to interview, or even if you just want to say hello, please drop me a line at humansofmusic at jaxta.com. That's humansofmusic, one word, at jaxta, J A X S T A.com. This episode was mixed by Lachlan Mitchell from Parliament Studios in Annandale, and the incidental music and theme song were written and performed by Sam Lockwood. Please remember to subscribe to the Humans of Music podcast so you never miss an episode, or even better, share it amongst your friends and rate and review it. And remember, next time you need to know who wrote a song, who produced a song, who engineered it, who played on it, who sang on it, who did anything on it, head to jaxta.com for all your official music credit information. Until the next episode of Humans of Music, I'm Rod Yates. Thanks for listening.